Hello everyone. Welcome to Things We Said Today in a Way, a Solar Eclipse edition. The solar eclipse of 2024 just ended, and now here we are with another show. And I got to take these off because, I mean, as great as they are to look at the sun, they really are blackout flash. You can't see anything. Ah, there you are. Darren DeVivo with you here, and welcome to Things We Said Today. Uh, minutes after the solar eclipse is over, we're with, the, with you with another show. Uh, I'm from WFUV Radio. Been at WFUV now for 40 years. Uh, can be heard uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, and Saturday afternoons. And uh, as is the case every other week, I'm joined by my good friend, Ken Michaels. Uh, Ken, you know from right now, his syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken also has a YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, uh, which is loaded with great interviews. Um, he's been in broadcasting just in general for over 40 years. Um, most of that dabbling in, in the Beatle world. And besides this show, uh, this podcast, he is a co-host of Talk More Tom, which uh, is a podcast that concentrates on the solo years of the four Beatles and Ken, great to see you. How are it's you? It's great to be with you, Darren, and you, Alan. And Alan goes in up. Hmm? right now. Alan's world is the McCartney legacy. Uh, Alan and Adrian Sinclair um, wrote the McCartney Legacy, uh, Volume One, nineteen sixty nine to nineteen seventy three. That was published in uh, 2002. 22. 22. 22. <laughs> Boy, the years are flying by to 2022, and Volume 2, covering the years 1974 to 1980, will be out in December. Uh, long before the McCartney Legacy series started, uh, Alan's been a music critic and a journalist for decades, and we worked for the New York Times in the classical music department, has written several other books on the Beatles from years past, and uh, joins us here on Things We Said Today. How are you, Alan? I'm fine, Darren. Good to see you again, and Ken. And, uh, well, you, I, I can't see you if I put these back on. <laughs> uh, but now that I've read my notes to uh, the cheat sheet here, uh, we have a very special show for you today because we have a special guest. Uh, I'll tell you about her in a few minutes. But first, let's throw it over to Ken for the news. Ken? Okay. Thank you, Darren. Well, the first news item is... As fresh as could be, news-wise, because we found out about this today. We're doing this show on April the 8th. And we learned that Ringo Starr's new song, February Sky, will be coming out this uh, Friday for streaming and downloading on all platforms. February Sky is part of his four-song EP coming out called Crooked Boy, which will be coming out first on Record Store Day. That's April the 20th on limited edition marble vinyl. In addition to that, because people are questioning, what about all the other formats? On April the 26th, the EP will be released digitally. And on May the 31st, the EP will come out on black vinyl and CD. Now the EP on black vinyl and the CD release, you can now pre-order. In addition to all that, there is an exclusive version of February Sky on Red Vinyl 7-inch as a single, which is you can only get at the Amoeba Music uh, Music Store. At the Amoeba Music Store in Hollywood. And that's on April the 18th. So all this excitement, four new songs coming from Ringo that we'll be hearing very soon, but the first song of the four, February Sky, we'll be hearing online uh this coming february and i'm excited and the amoeba uh single is going to be given out they're going to play the ep they're going to have an in-store uh play of the ep and uh i guess yeah they'll sell the single and uh, one of the other songs on the ep i don't know which one i forget is the a b-side so you're going to get half the ep if you're at amoeba in hollywood mm. um What's the date again? April. That is April 18th. Okay. And you okay. can't get it online or anything. 
I've tried to see if there's ways you can order it. But lucky people that live near uh, the Amoeba store. You know, okay. it's, a little, it's a little odd to have, uh, you know, if we go from the days of when the Beatles didn't put singles on albums because they didn't want you to have to buy the same track again if you bought the single and then you go buy the album. Um, if you put out a single from an EP, you're putting out half the EP. Mm. So I don't understand it as a marketing. <laughs> thing i mean why not just put out the whole ep all at once why put out a single from an ep it's almost <laughs> like i think that the actual grooves the music is secondary to this collectible this red vinyl single souvenir of this this ringo event at amoeba okay. uh, that you know throw it on the turntable once or twice and then put it away and wait for the full ep to come out I'm assuming that's hmm. okay. To me, it's more of trying to appeal to, to the collector that has to buy everything. That's what it's been all about. <laughs> Putting out different versions, whether it's vinyl, CD, different colored vinyl. There are fans out there that gobble all that stuff up. Do you think that the collector who has to have everything is at this point aging into a fixed income kind of, you know, period in their life where they can't buy everything? You know, why didn't they why didn't they put out all this stuff in the 60s when everybody had the money and could buy it? And it was also cheaper. <laughs> I don't know. I guess they're figuring that's the market that they're going for and in the case of someone like McCartney as you know, he puts out many different versions of his albums and New cases. Yeah. When I and Darren went to the uh, uh, Red and Blue Now and Then event in New York City, I asked our promotions guy whether or not this is Paul's idea to do all this stuff. He said, no, it's all the record company. Mm -hmm. Paul just signs off on it. So they're looking for ways to sell these records more. If you've got a more limited number of people that are going to buy it, mm -hmm. that's why you could sell more copies to those limited people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I look at it, you know? Mm. There are fans out there that we know that have to have all these things. Some of them happen to be part of this show. Well, there's that. <clears throat> uh must say that the Mind Games box set is being delayed now until July. This is on the John Lennon website. Went from June to July. They're still saying 72 tracks, 6 CDs, 2 Blu-rays, new stereo and Dolby Atmos mixes. Okay, it's not that much longer of a wait. I'm sure it's going to be great, just like Plastic Auto Band and Imagine were. The Beatles classic song Blackbird from the White Album has just been covered by Beyonce for her new album of country music called Cowboy Carter. But it's much more than just a cover. She actually is using Paul's acoustic guitar playing from the original Beatles recording for her version. Paul gave her gave his blessing. Paul gave his blessing for this and he says I am so happy with Beyonce's version of my song, Blackbird. I think she does a magnificent version of it, and it reinforces the civil rights message that inspired me to write the song in the first place. I think Beyonce has done a fab version and would urge anyone who has not heard it yet to check it out. You are going to love it. Have either of you heard it? Nice vocal harmonies on it. I mean, yeah. got to say that, you know, it it it, it didn't didn't depart in insane ways as cover versions sometimes do. Um, it, it kept pretty close to the song, which I guess it would have to do if you're using Paul's guitar part as the, as the spine of it. Well, right. eventually the guitar part becomes less prominent as the, as more vocals come in, you know? So I haven't heard the rest of the album. I've only heard that track. Yeah, well, it kind of caught me by surprise. I wasn't expecting it to have the same backing, yeah, you know, as the Beatles version. But uh, 
Beyonce sounds great on it. And like you said, really good harmonies there. You should check it out. Do you think they uh, sent her the guitar part from the multi-track or she just got it off the record uh, as it was? I would sure. hope that it would be from the multi-track. I mean, she's Beyonce. She's powerful. She can ask for these things. Right. But because no one said, you know, he's yeah. he's only said, well, you know, she she asked me and I said, sure. You know, he hasn't didn't he, no one's talked about the details of how the track was made, actually, and what the components are. Maybe that'll eventually come out. Yeah, I think it will. All right. The Sun has reported that Paul McCartney has rewarded the East Sussex family who returned his lost Hofner base a hefty six-figure sum. It was given to Kathy Guest, who found the instrument in her loft. It comes after weeks of negotiations with Paul's music company, MPL. The bass is said to be worth 10 million pounds. So, nice to see that this woman was rewarded quite heavily for returning the bass. A brand new book comes out on Paul's birthday, June the 18th, called The When We Was Fab, The Beatles' Australasian Tour, 1964, by Greg Armstrong and Andy Neal. As June will mark the group's 60th anniversary of their historical and hysterical Australasian tour, it remains deeply significant to the baby boomers who witnessed it firsthand and the millennials who wish they had been there for it. This tour is continuously celebrated as a major social landmark for Australia and New Zealand, a huge and lasting step in the advancing development of youth culture and a major highlight of the Beatles' remarkable career. The book is described by Amazon as the definitive and highly illustrated, with many previously unseen photographs, uh, an account of this extraordinary tour by the world's most creative and influential musical force, the key moment in the coming of age of Australian and New Zealand youth as they embrace the cultural explosion of the 1960s. Another book coming out this year is called Off the Ground, Paul McCartney in the 1990s by J.R. Moores. Amazon describes it as a sympathetic but clear-eyed exploration of Paul McCartney's work in the 1990s, arguably his most important since the rise of the Beatles. That's how they describe it here. That book is due out November 12th. On March the 19th, an updated version of the Beatles' Monopoly game was released to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' debut on The Ed Sullivan Show. The Op Games Company unveiled a revamped edition of the Beatles' Monopoly, complete with customized artwork highlighting various Beatles' albums and legendary career moments, such as the band's sold-out show at the Hollywood Bowl in 1964. All right, now on July the 28th, a special event will be happening in which the Pete Best Band and The Circle will be performing at the Valleydale Ballroom in Columbus, Ohio. It's actually a full day packed with events. There will be a lecture first with Pete Best and his brother Rogue discussing Pete's years in the Beatles at 2.30, followed by a meet and greet at 4 o'clock. The Circle will perform at 6 o'clock and the Pete Best Band at 7.15 and then a merchandise sale and an autograph signing with Pete Best and or The Circle. There are pricing levels for such an event and also an all-day pass. If you're interested, you can visit this website, valleydaleballroom.com. That's valley, V-A-L-L-E-Y, D-A-L-E, ballroom. Dot com And The Circle's new album, Revival, was just released a couple weeks ago. It's available to order at BigStirRecords.com. Don Daneman is still with the group, and you might recall they were recently, I think it was last year, at the Fest for Beatle Fans as a guest. Now, there is an all-star country band called The Front Men, made up of Richie McDonald, formerly of Lone Star, Larry Stewart of Restless Heart, and Tim Rushlow, formerly of Little Texas. They just released a new album with a song called Beatles and Eagles. That's a song about a guy who's broken up with his girlfriend, and when going through the boxes she left behind, he found Beatles and Eagles albums. And it's a good night to play some Beatles and Eagles music. It's quoted as saying it's going to be a Beatles and the Eagles 
under the needle kind of night. Lots of references to Beatles and Eagles songs and the names of members of both groups in the song. If you're also an Eagles fan, you should love this song. It's from their self-titled album, The Front Men. And many thanks to Scott O'Rourke for that information. Um, a week from last Friday, an online auction ended of a trove of letters, photos, and items owned by Patty Boyd that we mentioned here on this show. And the sale surpassed all expectations. Christie said the online sale of the Patty Boyd collection sold for around 2.82 million pounds, roughly $3.6 million, roughly seven times the pre-sale high estimate of around 380,000 pounds. There were 111 lots up for sale, including affectionate letters from her rock husbands, George Harrison and Eric Clapton, along with clothing, jewelry, drawings, and photographs, some of Patty, some by Patty. The biggest individual sale was the original artwork that Clapton chose for the front cover of the Derek and the Dominoes Layla album, which sold for two million pounds, roughly two and a half million dollars, 33 times the pre-sale estimate. Wow. That's, that's one successful auction right there. And speaking of Patty Boyd, we sent happy birthday wishes to her. On March 17th, she turned the big... Kato. Um, in an interview with American songwriter Danny Harrison, who just released his first new album in six years, Inner Standing, he says that he plans on releasing a video from two concerts he gave at the London Club Omiera. That was in October 2023. And the concert video could be part of a deluxe version of Inner Standing. Danny said he also plans on touring behind the album but no dates have been announced yet. Thanks to Joanne Michaels for that information. And uh, we're going to close with two passings of note to report. First, John Sinclair has died. John was a champion of legal marijuana, a counterculture hero and poet. He died last Tuesday of congestive heart failure at the age of 82. The Detroit News reports Sinclair was an influential activist who was best known for his fight toward legalizing marijuana and for his role as band manager for the MC5. The Davison native was also a champion of civil rights and co-founder of the radical anti-racist group, the White Panther Party. His representative, Matt Lee, says he was on the forefront of the marijuana movement, that's for sure. But I don't think people realized how knowledgeable he was in American music and he was a certified expert in all forms of American jazz and rhythm and blues. John Lennon wrote and recorded the song John Sinclair to help support John, who had been sentenced to, to help support John, who had been sentenced to 10 years in jail for possession of two joints. As the song says, they gave him 10 for two. John and Yoko headlined a benefit concert to free John Sinclair at the Chrysler Arena in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with supporting acts Bob Seeger and Stevie Wonder. The event lasted 14 hours and drew 15,000 people. And three days later, Sinclair was released from prison after serving less than three years. The song John Sinclair ended up on the John and Yoko Elephant's Memory album sometime in New York City in June of 1972, and that was long after Sinclair was freed from prison. The song was later covered by the band Blind Melon. And Matt Lee also said he was definitely on the cutting edge of counterculture. When you look at how other towns had their Abby Hoffmans and their Jerry Rubens and those people, he was the Detroit equivalent to them. He was definitely Detroit's resident radical. And Sinclair leaves behind a huge body of work in the form of books and recorded poems and essays backed by blues and jazz musicians. His last book, Collected Poems, 1964 to 2024, is currently at the printer, set to be released any time now, by M.L. Liebler at uh, Ridgeway Press. Mm. I like the end of the times a bit. I don't know if you read it. Um, and they're talking about how, you know, ma now marijuana is legal. And someone says to him, so, John, it, it looks like everything's come around full circle. 
And he said, yeah, it would have been better if they gave back all the weed they took. <laughs> <laughs> Good sense of humor there. Um, and finally, very sorry to report of the passing of musician, record producer, and songwriter Mark Spiro, who wrote songs with Julian Lennon, including Saltwater and the very recent Every Little Moment, as well as writing for John Waite and for Heart and Cheap Trick. He died from cancer on his birthday. And Julian wrote, I am devastated that I will never see him again, laugh with him again, be creative with him again. But I am so thankful to have known him and his incredible loving family. Salt water wells in my eyes and the tears roll in between. And the quote. And speaking of Julian. On a positive note. Happy birthday, Julian. It's his birthday today, April right. 8th. Yeah, hey, happy and, birthday. Um, he turned 61 today. And for Julian, I'll put these back on. <laughs> All right, enough of that. One thing I want to just jump in here very yeah. quickly. I hope I describe this. Uh, about a week or two ago, I started seeing uh, people on Facebook uh, posting their um, and citizen, if I can hold, wow, that's not working. Um, citizen of Newtopia um, identity card. OK, um, this, I think, might be sort of a sub. Website, is there such a thing? There is now to John Lennon's site and perhaps a way to begin the promotion for the Mind Games box set. Hmm. Uh, the website is go to. No, it's not. It's just <laughs> it's just citizen of dot com. And you go there and you basically, I'm sure, signing up just for on to be on a on a mailing list. Um, and you get an identity card, which I'm trying to show you here, but the glare, maybe if I hold it a little, you can sort of... Anyway, after you fill it out, you get the email with your membership number. Nothing really fancy attached. You're allowed to put, when you sign up, a little quote that gets uh, printed, I guess, um, on the website. You know, and I put something like war is over with peace and love or uh, connect Ringo's slogan with. So I uh, shared it on Facebook. And today, uh, during the eclipse, while I'm getting emails and texts from people, um, I get notifications that um, it was taken down on my two Facebook pages because I guess it was spammy in their eyes. Uh, something about maybe what I wrote about peace and war is over and evidently the citizen of Newtopia ID offends the Facebook hierarchy. So they pull those down off my Facebook pages. Uh, but the crap that I get sent from them and the friend requests uh, that come on a daily basis, that's okay. But like a little John Lennon. So they're, they're anti-Utopianites. I, I, maybe they, they uh, something I wish I don't have the the reason uh, given to me on why. Maybe I could get it really quick here on Jim, why it was. Uh, oh, thank you. No, I don't Jim, want you. In Carville, Texas. All right, I'll thank maybe you. share it next week on what the reasoning was for pulling those those posts down off my Facebook page. Basically, I was soliciting likes or something in a shady way but i don't know if there, anyone else had this experience if they signed up got this certificate and just popped it on facebook for the heck of it and then now it's i'm not in any trouble i don't think with facebook but just a little weird well to take a page from arlo guthrie we should start a movement <laughs> everyone watching this should download their newtopian identity card yeah, yeah. and post it on facebook <laughs> it's citizen of newtopia dot com uh is what i think uh yeah citizen of newtopia.com don't type go to citizen of newtopia.com uh and see what happens but so it probably think, again is like an early stage of beginning the promotional ball rolling for the mind games release 
So you Who think that? the reason why this was taken down was because you're promoting, you're maybe, helping promote the uh, mind? Maybe, my, or, or maybe my phrase, what I wrote, because you can put a slip if you wanted to, yeah. uh, when you sign up, they allow you to put something. I just, well, I guess it could it be construed as being a political message, I guess. You know, war is over with through peace Basically, and love. It's something full of hard. political messages. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And it was taken down off both my pages. Uh, and I got the notification today, like a week or two later. So I don't know if that's happening to anyone else out there. So I just thought I'd bring it up. But uh, so that's it for the news, Ken. That is all. That's it for the news. And it is time to um, jump into the uh, body of the show with a very, very special guest, author Dana Klausner. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Ken. And now on to a very special uh, guest that we have been threatening to have on for months and months now and just with scheduling. And it got very busy for us on the show uh, late last year. And then we had the downtime while Alan put put, put to finish Alan and Adrian, the finishing touches on volume two of the McCartney legacy. So what was potentially going to happen in the fall is finally happening today. And it gives me um, great pleasure to welcome our special guest for this edition of Things We Said Today, author Dana Klausner. Hello, Dana. Hi, Darren. I'm thrilled to be here. Been waiting a long time. uh, (laughs) Well, Dana's book has been out now. It came out last year, right? Came out in August. Published in the fall, I think? August. Yeah, last Uh, August. I think it's backwards. I don't think you can see, but no, it's for fine. it's fine. Beetle <laughs> Beetlemania lives on. Super fans in the 21st century. It's Dana's book, and if you look closely, <laughs> why? My goodness, look at the picture in the center. That's me and Ringo and my daughter Emily, who I believe was about 11 or 12. Uh, and the publisher chose that to be one of the pictures on the cover. And I was very honored. And we'll talk about why, the why, what, and how of that picture and the book with Dana today on things we said today. Uh, so again, welcome, Dana. And uh, congratulations on what isn't your first book, but this is your first music book, right? No, this is my first book, but I've been oh. a journalist for a very long time. I was a feature writer and columnist for the Baltimore Sun. Um, I've had essays in Chicken Soup for the Soul and on Next Avenue, but this is my first book of my own. Um, actually, you have you how much writing have you done uh, in the past that involved music or musical artists or anything? Have you done any? No, no, no. So it's interesting that for your first book, you would choose something that you hadn't a topic that you hadn't touched on. Uh, in your career as a writer. You know what it is? I've been a Beatles fan since birth. And, um, you know, one day I got a, another writing book in the mail. I'm always trying to learn more about writing. I've been a writer, you know, for as long as I can remember. And I've been in many, you know, publications and had many staff writing jobs. And I got a book in the mail. And my daughter said to me, you know so much about writing. You should write a book. And I said, you know what? I want to write a book about the Beatles because I thought I had read every book there was, but apparently, you know, I stopped my collection in the seventies. So I missed so much, but my book isn't about the Beatles. It's about the Beatles fans that are still, um, you know, following the group and and watching podcasts like yours now in the 21st century. Um, and you're in the book and other Beatles DJs are in the book and there's tribute bands. And there's people that um, met at international Beatle week in um, Liverpool and got married. And there's um, what else? Help me, Darren. I'm sorry. You we did. I think the audio crack broke up a little there. 
Okay. So there's people that met and married at Beetle Week. There are people, there are fans that have followed Paul around the world. There's a woman in particular that follows him around the world, but she doesn't have any money. So she sleeps in airports and lives on peanut butter sandwiches. There's crazy stories. There was a fan that um, uh, was pregnant and her water broke. And her doctor said she needed a C-section to avoid an infection. And she said, not today, because she wanted her baby to be born on Paul McCartney's birthday, which was the next day. So she delayed it a full day so he'd be born on Paul's birthday. Yeah, there's all sorts of stories like that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you what, what, what I love about your book is that you pointed out that you stopped collecting Beatle books decades ago. Right. And I remember when I was growing up in the 70s, there weren't many. Mm -hmm. And I had two that were like Bibles for me. The Beatles Forever by Nicholas Schaffner. And there was a book by um, Ron Schaumburg called Growing Up with the Beatles. I think that was his last name, Schaumburg. And it was his story. It was kind of like his autobiography, growing up, coming of age, and following the Beatles and collecting their music. Um, there's been a boom, I don't know, maybe over the past 20 years. And there have been so many books coming out on the Beatles to be able to find one that has a unique topic, uh, something that hasn't been covered, um, is admirable. And uh, your book takes a look at the fans today and what keeps them fans. And so when it's time to start accumulating these stories, um, where do you begin? Where was the starting point for you? You know, well, what happened, the way I came up with the story was many years before I actually started writing it. Um, you know, I was a fan in a bubble. I didn't know any other fans. I grew up in the 70s. It wasn't the thing, you know, everybody's listening to Donna Summer and the Bee Gees. So I really, I knew in my head there were millions of people, but I didn't know anybody. And um, the first time I went to Liverpool was about 2004. And I didn't know anything. I just typed in things to do in Liverpool. And I, I came up with the Magical Mystery Tour bus. So I got on the bus and the bus was sold out with people from all over the world speaking all different languages with the one thing that they had in common was they knew every lyric to every Beatles song. And at that point, I knew there was a story in that. So when my daughter said, you should write a book, I said, OK, I'm writing that book. So I started it by just typing in. I was living in New York and I just typed in Beatles walking tours in New York City. And I came up with someone, you know, very well, Susan Ryan who's uh, one of the co-coordinators of the Fest for Beatles fans in New York. Um, so Susan came out to Long Island very graciously and talked and talked and talked. We talked for two hours and she became my Beatles sister. And it just went from there. She gave me five people and, you know, and so on and so on and so on, like that old commercial. But then also I just started Googling people and I found, uh, you know, Bill Huckle at the Cavern Club in Liverpool uh, Charles Rosane was a big help uh, connecting me with tribute bands, Clark Gilmore. No one said no. No one said no. When I asked you, you know, I just I just uh, was looking at a Beatles Facebook group and I just typed in, does anyone here, has anyone here ever met a Beatle? And you chimed in and I said, would you like to be in the book? And you said, yes. No one said no. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And also one of my uh, colleagues at WFUV Radio, New York City, uh, Radio icon Dennis Elsis is also in your book. Uh, Dennis interviewed John Lennon in 1974 uh, at WNEWFM. So I think after we were finished talking, Dana, uh, then I put you in touch with Dennis. And he, uh, I think we're very close to each other in the book. Uh, but I did make it a point to tell Dennis, not only am I on the cover, but my story comes first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dennis very kindly connected me with Peter Asher. And I actually got to meet Peter Asher in his home in Malibu, which was such a thrill. And he was just so nice. And he had these little dogs that were just running around. And it just felt so homey and comfortable. It was great. And then also Tom Frangione's in the book and mm -hmm. Ken Dashow. Right. So, Q104.3 mm -hmm. in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so was this a, a type of, um, you know, Doing this show with Alan, uh, we see the pressures of writing um, with deadlines upon him and books that are, you know, a little beyond my my I'm like coloring book level when it comes to reading. Uh, <laughs> but Alan's 
you know, we got a hard deadline. In fact, we had to shut the show down, as I mentioned at the top, for a couple of weeks. Um, did you have, uh, were you piecing this together over time? Or did yes. you immediately go to a publisher and have a hard finish point, finish line put up for you? When I went to the publisher, I thought I was done. Um, at that point, I had 50,000 words done. And very happily, they accepted the book, but they said, oops, our minimum is 75,000 words. <laughs> so it took me four years to write 50,000 words and three months to write it, write it 50% more, 25,000 words. So, yeah, it was an effort, but it was so much fun. Every story gave me chills. And, you know, like my kids couldn't be in the room when I was interviewing because I was just the biggest fan going, oh, my God, oh, my God, I can't be real, you know. So, yeah, it was just so much fun. Uh, Alan, Ken, uh, who, uh, you mean, my name, oh, Ken, you have a question? Yeah, I want to touch on something that we've talked about here on this show with Darren, and you kind of agree, and you just said it a few moments ago, that it was tough to be a Beatle fan in the 70s, and I really find that kind of hard to believe, because in the 70s, you had the height of the Beatles' popularity with their solo careers, you had Wings, being so popular with album after album, so many hits. You had the Red and the Blue collections come out in 1973, which were, they did phenomenally well. And you had compilations like rock and roll music. You had hits galore from the Beatles, especially from the solo careers. You know, there used to be that running joke. Did you know that Paul was in a band before Wings? So I remember when I was in high school through all that and, some friends of mine were into wings, you know, and y your experience was the opposite of that, despite all that. So, yeah, so opposite. And Susan actually said the same thing that, you know, people would tell, you know, she's a big John Lennon fan and people would tell her, oh, you know, he's old enough to be your father, you know, and it's your parents music. And why would you listen to that? And, you know, and I was getting the same kind of thing, like, oh, you know, Beatles are, you know, so, so dead, they're broken up. And, you know, it was disco. Disco was the thing where I went to school. I went to school on Long Island, you know, and it was you know, Saturday Night Fever just came out and oh. it was either disco or Led Zeppelin. And for me, going to grammar school in the Bronx, it was, it seemed like it was all kiss on mm. this side, disco on the other. And in the middle, there were the disco fans who liked kiss. And then it was me. <laughs> with into wings. Literally. I'm not joking. I'm into wings. And everyone else is into Kiss or Disco, except Kevin McNamara, like the Allman Brothers band. Uh, but Kevin was in with the kids that made the trouble. So he was left alone. Uh, I wasn't. But it, was, it wasn't... It um, was I don't recall the Beatles being um, front and center at all. No, no. They definitely... The that's really strange, you know, when you consider you being in the number one market in New York City while all this is going on. How could the charts not reflect, you know, the popularity at that time of the young kids in school? Yeah, it's an interesting debate on why that is. Now, Dana, you're from Long Island originally, and Ken, you are as well. Yeah. Right? But there's maybe an example of um, different cultures in this country um that you know have different tastes and different you know um traditions or whatnot and where i came from in the bronx it was all it seemed to be it just was a, it was it was kiss it was disco and there was no there was no it didn't matter who was on the charts mm -hmm. the bgs were the disco uh, fans like them there was lots of graffiti on our notebooks disco sucks and lots of kiss kiss logos. I was very good at drawing the wings. W. Um, that seemed to kind of go away when I got to high school. In the early eighties, that it started to become a little bit more. I don't know. There was a wider breadth of uh, artists that people were fans of. Um, maybe it's because I was so young. Uh, we were young in the seventies. When at, at such a young age, you haven't totally developed taste yet. So whatever was big in the media at the time. Yeah. I was going to say to all of you kids, it is so great to be a geezer who grew up in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> 
we didn't have to worry about the popularity of anything else because nothing approached the Beatles. You know, and the ones that did, the Stones and other groups and early Zeppelin, I mean, that was okay. But the Beatles were still the zenith of Western Civ, as in fact they are. Um, so thank you. Thank you for finally letting me discover what's great about being old. <laughs> well, my experience is not what, what you went through, Darren, and, and you, Dana, but and when you talk about disco, <laughs> just for a second here, disco really took, started to dominate in the second half of the 70s, really. I mean, 74, there were signs of it, but from 75 on, you know, you had Casey and the Sunshine Band and Donna Summer and the Bee Gees and all that. But the first half of the 70s, there was a lot of rock. <laughs> and yeah, but I, I was in high school, the second half. What's that? I, grad I was in high school the second half of the 70s. Yeah. I graduated okay. in 1980, so. That's probably okay. why we think so much of disco as being part of the 70s, but, you know, it wasn't there the entire decade. No, but, you know, like in my case, I'm the extreme case here because I didn't get to high school until the fall of 79. You know, so I had all of that, all of the 70s were right. from kindergarten to eighth grade. And it really was, I guess, in my case, probably what was popular, um, what was on the radio, what was on television. And that's what that's what fed the, t the tastes mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the people I associated with, my friends. Um, there was a few Beatle fans here or there. A friend of mine, a close friend of mine, we got into wings through me, but it was nothing compared again to the pockets of, you know, the kiss, kiss folk and the disco fans. And, um, <coughs> but um, anyway, it is interesting how, through the decades, different groups, different cultures picked up on, on different things. Mm. Okay. I just want to say one of the one of the um stories that I enjoyed reading in your book, Dana, was um the first one with Lawrence Juber. And mm. Lawrence has always been one of the kindest people and gracious. And anytime I need an interview with him, he's there. Um, but what struck me about what he said in your book was what he learned from being with Paul McCartney that went beyond the music. And that is that family comes first, mm -hmm. you know, and he observed that with Linda and with the kids and he decided to be the same way with hope and with his kids. So little things like that. I really appreciate learning in the book. Yeah. And then there's the whole story of how he and hope met. Did you get a chance to read about that? That was through the well, she was she's Sherwood Schwartz's daughter, and Sherwood Schwartz created Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, right? You know, which shaped our generation and uh, my generation. And she was a huge Beatles fan. And then John Lennon's murder knocked her out, you know, and she was depressed and not getting out of bed. And yeah, you know, she grew up in Beverly Hills, and her mom, at her wits' end, said, "Just go get your hair done. Just go do something. Get your hair done." So just to make her mom happy, she got out of bed, went to the hair salon. And the hairstylist said, oh, you look so sad. He said, go take a walk around the block. And when you come back, I'll have finished with my client and, and we can talk. So she's walking around the block with her head down, moping around. And she bumps bang into somebody. She sees boots. She looks up. It's Ringo. Huh. <laughs> So she says to Ringo, you know, oh, I'm just so sorry about John and starts to walk away. And Ringo says, hold on. He says, you know, I can see this has really struck you hard. He says, you know, what I'm doing to get through it is I'm really throwing myself into my work. So, you know, she gets her hair done. Her dad created the Brady Bunch. He was working on a new show, The Brady Brides. He asked, she was also trying to be a writer. She just graduated college. He asked her to work on the show. And normally she would say no because she wanted, you know, a name for herself. She didn't want to ride on his coattails. But because of what Ringo said, she said yes. So being on the what, you know, this and that and this and that, she met people. She started dating um, Robin Williams. Robin Williams went to New York to film World According to Garp. 
She went to New York with him, was waiting for him to be done with an interview at a bar and uh, was talking to a woman sitting next to her at the bar. And the woman said, oh, you know, three of my friends are here. They're musicians. You know, you should meet them. So the three guys start walking and in the middle is Lawrence Juber. She says it was like a movie, blurry dissolve. No one else appeared in the room. She still didn't know that he was Paul McCartney's guitarist. They went to dinner. She went back to his apartment. She saw a big poster of Wings, and she's looking, and there he is. And the rest is history. They've been married what, over 40 years. Right. Yeah. I had no idea that she dated Robin Williams. <laughs> I forgot yeah. that. Wow. she's She's got a story to tell right there. <laughs> And then it's funny because then as the years went by, Lawrence was very involved in the music end of the of the shows uh, that that Hope's dad was developing, mm -hmm. and some of the Brady Bunch uh, sequels or films. Um, and Hope was in at least one episode, right, of the Brady Bunch, I believe. Well, she, she didn't I, tell me that. She told me that she became um, story editor of the Brady Brides. You know, she rose through the ranks. I, I don't know if she was on an episode. A little, like, a little bit sure. part. Yeah, I thought that she dated Greg in the, in the in an episode, episode or something like that. Yeah. Something. Yeah, I've seen it. I think I've seen a still photo on probably on Facebook. But um, that's great. That's great. And and Lawrence was, I'm sure, wonderful to talk with and um, giving you a little bit of an inside scoop, being that he was inside. Uh, but anyway, so hmm. both of their stories separately are in the book. She's in this section of um, "Love Is All You Need." You know, people that met because of their obsession with the Beatles. So both of their stories are in the book. And then there's an even better story about their daughter. Um, you know, Hope uh, Lawrence was working with George on Shanghai Surprise, and Hope's favorite Beatle was George, and she had some connection to all the other three and never got to meet George. So he promised her she could go to the studio and meet him. But the day she was supposed to go to the studio, she went into labor. So as they say, instead of here comes the sun, it was here comes the baby. And then uh, two days later, she did get to go to the studio with two-day-old Ilse. George picked up the baby, danced around with her, and then said something in Sanskrit and kissed her on the head. And they asked what he said, and he said he gave her the gift of music. And now she's an award-winning right. songwriter. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. You know, I know that she wrote something recently for Harry Styles' album. and Yeah, she's, she's actually in, uh, worked with many people in a very short period of time. Yeah. And done at least one album of her own. Mm hmm Yeah. Very talented family. No doubt about that. I really appreciate the whole section where you devote devoted to DJs. Because to me, um, you know, this world of people who are continually exposing the Beatles music, talking about it on the radio, whether it's a radio show or a podcast, that's what keeps the interest going. Mm -hmm. It's one of many things that keeps the interest going. And so many of these people, I mean, uh, for example... You had Ken Dashow, who's been doing his show for 20 years on Q104. Darren here, who's been on the radio for 40 years now. Dennis Elsis, 50 years, more than that. <laughs> Going back to, uh, you know, WNEW and even before that. And Tom Franjone, who's been on uh, Sirius XM for how long now? It's been a while. Something like maybe 10 years. Has it been a, what year did this did, did the channel launch? Do you remember? Because it was probably a year or two after it started. Tom may have been behind the scenes though at first mm -hmm. before he came on the air. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in a way, we the DJs who kind of. I mean, some of the some of the fan stories in your book, Dana, are are wonderful because they are they're the wonderful coincidences or or. or uh, incredible accidents in a way for the DJs. We cheated in a way because we had a little bit of an in. Mm -hmm. We were, we had a way to kind of break the, break the, uh, break the ice a little bit. 
which was the case. I know you mentioned a couple of my um, uh, stories in your book. One of them was pretty much the result of being a WFUV, and the other had absolutely nothing to do with my career. But uh, um, I don't know if you want me to, to, in a nutshell, go go tell you know what what's in Dana's book. Yeah, if I should do it now. But um, the one, of course, that I always remember is the accident, the happy coincidence that had nothing to do with my career, which I actually didn't have a career at the time. I was at WFUV, had no clue that it was going to be practically a lifelong thing. Um, my, my family, uh, my parents owned a house on eastern Long Island in East Hampton. My dad was a fisherman. So in 79, he bought this very small, rickety house in the spring section of East Hampton. And pretty much over the years, through the 80s, fixed it up himself uh, with a friend's help. And, well, me, I was to, you know, dig the holes in the backyard for the bushes. Um, so... McCartney's in-laws, the Eastmans, lived on Lily Pond Lane uh, in East Hampton at the time. I'm not sure if they're still uh, still based there, but uh, I say you would see in the local paper, the East Hampton Star and Dan's papers, blurbs every once in a while that Paul McCartney and Linda were seen at this restaurant or maybe uh, there was some uh, ritzy party going on and the McCartneys were there. So in 1988, uh, I believe I was aware going into that summer that Paul was out, out, had rented a place uh, in Amagansett, which I think he was using for rehearsals, perhaps for Flowers in the Dirt, the recording sessions. So I was in the car one day with my parents. Very cool. You're in your early 20s and you're out in the Hamptons <laughs> with your mom and dad. In your dad's rickety old Jeep. Now, this Jeep uh, was a lemon from the day he bought it. It was apple green from 1975. Everything went wrong with this with this car that my father bought. I felt bad for him. I mean, you drive the wheels would fall off for no reason. I mean, so because he was a fisherman, intended to drive up on the beach and spend lengthy periods of time right on the shore. Um. Uh, the, the chassis was pretty well rusted after just a short period of time. So we're heading towards Montauk. I'm in the back seat. My father's taking the side streets to avoid Montauk Highway through East Hampton and Amagansett. And we come out on 27, which is Montauk Highway, uh, and avoid all the little village traffic. East Hampton, Amagansett again. So as we're coming out onto out of one of the side roads in Amagansett and approaching 27 Montauk Highway, the car goes by and I see a, a, a woman with blonde hair in the back seat. And I thought it looked like Linda. Nah, couldn't, you know. And she seemed to be acknowledging somebody that was outside the car on the road. Within seconds, my mother in the front seat says, uh, that looks like Paul over there. I'm like, no, it can't possibly be. It was Paul McCartney across on the other side of the highway on his bicycle with James and some of James's friends. So, and cars are slowing down and beeping and he's waving at everyone passing by. You know, Montauk Highway out there is a two-lane highway. Uh, and he eventually makes his way across the street. And he's heading right for where my father's truck is in the intersection. And I can't get out of the car because the door is rusted shut. <laughs> the back door. I don't even know how I got in the car. I probably was crawling in through the tailgate in the back, crawl over the back seat, which if I did that today, I'd end up in the hospital for a week. But couldn't get out of the car, rolled the window down. Uh, halfway down, the glass falls into the door um, because inside the door, there's nothing that's, you know, the metal is all 
rotting out. I can't get out of the car. I'm putting my shoulder into the door, uh, trying to get out. My mother, meanwhile, jumps out of the car and she corners Paul as he comes across the highway. And I hear her saying, Paul, Paul, my son is a big fan. He's He's been a fan of yours since he was a baby. And finally, I reach out and I open the door from the outside button. That worked somehow. And I get out of the car. And why would my father have a legal pad in the car? I, I don't know. So uh, he quick tosses the pad at me and he starts yelling out to Paul. Hey, Paul, my son's a big <laughs> fan of yours. He's got his, your records are all over the house. Completely had to blow Paul's mind. Like, who who are these people? Uh, and I was, it was a blur. He scribbled his name on it on, on the legal pad. Paul McCartney said, You have very nice parents, but I got to go because his son and their friends kept going on the bikes. They didn't stop, they just kept going down. It was a country road, but still. And Paul looked like he had just rolled out of bed, white, dirty t shirt, shorts, hair wasn't combed. I can't picture him anymore. Even after we, uh, even the rest of the trip out to Montauk, um, it was like the, immediately became a blur, mm. uh, and that was that. You know, Ringo was through FUV. It was arranged uh, meetings backstage, interview in two thousand three. That's kind of boring. But the McCartney story was a classic only because, in typical DeVivo family fashion. Uh, <laughs> Car doors don't open, and uh, the the window, like I said, the window, you see, you just have to catch the window when you rolled it down. It was a two-hand job. Catch the window so it doesn't fall down in the door, because then you got to open the door up to get the glass out. Uh, but it was his Jeep he fished in, and he, that stayed on the road for many years, even after that. So that was my little... After that story, Dana thought maybe maybe this book isn't such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite stories because it was just so funny. You know, it was like a skit. I even said in the book, you would think this was on Saturday Night Live. You know, it was just so funny. Some of my favorite stories are um, people that got on stage with Paul during a concert or during the soundtrack and got his autograph and then got it tattooed. Mm -hmm. And one yeah. of my favorites is uh, Nina Galper, and I don't you might know her, Darren, because she goes to the fest all the time. But she got his autograph on her foot. So there's a great picture of her with her foot all the way up his thigh. And she is dying. But yeah, these stories are great. And the through line to every story is he makes you so comfortable. You're in front of tens of thousands of people, but you're just talking to him. And all your nerves disappear. And he makes you comfortable. And he's humble. And no one has ever said, you know, they're nervous getting up to the point of meeting him. And then once they meet him, he just makes it a normal conversation. I don't know if that would happen to me. I think I would faint. But that's the story I hear. <laughs> There's also the, the mother and daughter that went on stage. Right. All signed their backs. The same place on, on the back of their right shoulder. Um, you know, the mom was a fan her whole life. And then, of course, she instilled it on her daughter. Her daughter was vegetarian since fourth grade because of Paul. Yeah, they got on stage together and got the same autograph in the same place. What I like about Nina's story, too, is um, she's a, uh, I don't know exactly what her title is, but she works at can cancer centers. So she wears ballet flats and she gets people, you know, people are always interested to hear the story of her tattoo. So she makes, you know, people having chemotherapy and other stages of cancer. Everybody smiles and rubs the tattoo and loves the story. So it's just so sweet. That's great. Ken, anything else? Oh, we should uh, go why don't we let Alan ask a question? You're on the air, Alan. Okay. Um, you know, I was wondering when you know you you have all of these stories and there and there's a huge mix of people. Some of many of whom are professional people. You know, ranging from Lawrence Juber and Peter Asher to the radio people and uh, the the guys in the sounds alike bands and 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 a lot of them are just regular old people who get autographed or um uh one of my favorite stories was the the a record signing story where uh the woman w walks up to him gets him to sign the album goes off and 
loses it and <laughs> her husband is behind her online and uh and paul says who should i sign it to and he says my wife she's over there losing it and he says you're a good man <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit like what he said to Darren, you know. But you're, you've, you're, you've you're got good great parents. parents yeah. you know? <laughs> um, you know, know, and it, thinking when this woman comes flying out of this apple green jeep, yeah. and, and 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 her son is trying to bust through the back door. Anyway, sorry, Alex. So the question was basically with this this range of people and experiences. Um, when you started it, talking to Susan and, uh, you know, getting your first lists, had you, did you envision having, you know, th the kind of divisions that you have and, and how did it, it just organized itself as you went on? Yeah, you know, I really, I had no clear path. I had no outline. I, I didn't know how to find people. You know, like I said, I didn't know any Beatle fans. Um, along the way, you know, I would talk to one person from a tribute band and I'd say, well, there has to be more, you know, and then I found Charles Rosane, who uh, he um, collects the audition tapes for the, I believe, just for the American tribute bands and sends them over to Clark Gilmore at Cavern City Tours, who puts together International Beatle League. So, so, you know, in that way, so I spoke to Charles and uh, put his story in. He runs tours from New York to Liverpool and London. And then he connected me to the tribute bands. And then while I was interviewing Bill Heckel, who's the director of Cavern City Tours, he said, oh, you know, we we run International Beatles Week. You know, and there are some people that have met there and fell in love and got married. I said, oh, well, that would be fantastic. Could mm -hmm. I interview some of them? So it just kind of snowballed that way. Mm -hmm. Um. I was mildly surprised that in, in the in the beginning of the book, you talked about Joe Rafano from Liverpool mm -hmm. Shuffle being one of the people who put you on to things. But when you got to the Liverpool Shuffle section, you it wasn't Joe. You drank <laughs> an alley instead. And uh, um, so I was I was sort of actually uh, looking forward to reading about um, Joe Rafano because he actually played at my wedding and so did oh. Liverpool Shuffle. <laughs> Um, but he also played on his own during the ceremony. So I thought, oh, let's, let's, let's read read Joe's backstory here. And it was, never was in there. Uh, well, so was, maybe that was an I outtake. You, when, when the next edition comes out, you can add Joe. <laughs> Time for the sequel. You know, it's funny. You know, I've been going to, uh, you know, I went to the Beatles Fest in New York, Fest for Beatles Fan in New York. And I went to Beatles on the Beach in uh, Delray Beach, Florida. Everybody that comes up to buy a book, has their own story. It just never yeah. ends. There are just so right. many stories. So yeah, either a sequel or a podcast or something. That's why you were able to come up with the, that last 25,000 words in just a few <laughs> weeks after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, 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 it is incredible. Everyone does have a story. And, and um, you know, some of the time I was reading it thinking, um, well, I don't know, does, does someone who does this professionally count as a super fan? But yeah, I guess so, you know, um, why not? You know, it starts with the fandom and then they do it professionally. You right. know, everybody in the tribute band started, you know, following the Beatles when they were young. And, you know, one one person um, went to see Beatlemania when he was a teenager and realized, hey, wait, I can do that. I can be a Beatle. You know, and then, and then there's a man who was in that Beatlemania show that he saw, so it all kind of rolls together but it all starts with the fandom even um Vivek Tawari who uh he's a Broadway yeah. producer he just produced um Jag Little Pill you know right. huge show and um so he wrote the fifth Beatle about Brian Epstein but it started when he was young and a Beatles fan you know and that's how he found the path to Brian Epstein who actually influenced him to get into the arts because what he says is you know and in a young Indian man is supposed to become a doctor or an engineer, but he always wanted to be in the arts and he didn't know a way to do that. And when he saw Brian Epstein in his mold of being, you know, this businessman, and then he, he found the Beatles in a basement, you know. So, yeah, it was his influence that made him be what he is. Mm -hmm. Um. Was there ever any temptation to, once you began getting so many of the professional people, to sort of, of like, 
the non-professional people that people wouldn't know of being edged out of the book or did you always want no, to maintain it no balance? because those those are some of my favorite stories because that's true yeah you know, they're dreamy you know it could be anybody i've still never met any of them and, and it just makes me feel like oh you know one of the through lines through the book is oh i'm one step closer to that paul hug and uh you know, I went to see Ringo in uh, West Virginia in October and I'm calling Darren frantically, can you get oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> yeah, so so it's the dream. Like, oh <laughs> was it um how easy or difficult was it to sell this to a publisher? Um did they did did they quickly see the value of a, a study of fans as opposed to the Beatles themselves or did you know did they recognize that this was a a niche that hadn't been really explored too much well you know first I went uh trying to find an agent route you know I was trying to you know follow the rules but agents just didn't have the vision you know they kept saying you need the background you need the history and I would say well there's thousands of those you know I think Beatles fans know all that and that's not really what the book is so um, yeah, I found this publisher. It's McFarland Publishers, and they do a lot of the, a lot of pop culture. And yeah, it, it was days when they answered me. I sent the I sent the query, and days later they answered. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the vision, <laughs> you know. And I really appreciate that they did. Yeah. Um, do you have another project coming up? Um, I have some in mind. I was thinking about doing like a Beatles collector, but from the point of view of um, uh, getting in touch with the big auctioneer houses and finding the big items and then finding the people who bought them and why they would spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and what it all means to them. And then also I thought connected with different Beatles tattoos and why people got those tattoos and what it means to them. When you mentioned um, the collectors thing, um, I mean, it was a, a conversation recently with someone um, about butcher covers and basically everybody I know who has a butcher cover or sometimes several butcher covers has great stories about how each one of those butcher covers was found. And, uh, you know, there's probably, there's probably a book in the butcher cover. Yeah, well, connect me to them. I'd love to do it. <laughs> yeah, I love you know, the that's, one. That's the best part for me. I get to hear these stories. You know, I always wished I was born earlier and I was there for it. And I get to hear the stories, and it's just such a thrill. You should More probably... than once, the people that got in, in yard in garage sales. Oh, I bought this uh, Beatle album for two dollars. I didn't know what he had. It's a butcher cover. I'm like, why can't I find a right. butcher cover in the flea market in the garage sale? Uh, instead, I find like you know. Slim Whitman's greatest hits. Yeah. <laughs> I know some people story... who got a butcher cover when, when the album came out and ended up bringing it back to the store because she wanted her album to be like all of her friends. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. I was going to say, Dana, you should have uh, you, you should try and find out who bought that uh, Beatles painting that just sold. Of mm -hmm. images of a woman because there's it's the only painting that we know of where all four of them collaborated together I that was just I'm familiar with that what's yeah. that story yeah they they worked on it when they were in uh the tokyo hilton hotel when they were performing in 66 for several shows um in tokyo and they had to stay in their room most of the time and when they did uh, the promoter brought over a lot of uh, materials for them to paint and a sheet of paper and they worked on it on this table with a lamp in the middle and they all made their own individual painting. Wow. Wow. And that's a soul? Yeah. Just a couple of months ago. We were oh. talking about it here on this show. Dana, doesn't that sound like when when your kids were little and you brought a box of crayons when you go to the restaurant? And have them draw on the back of the other side of the placemat here. Sure. Picture for me and stop. You're making noise. You're making me crazy. Here's a crayon. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Or, or a snow day, you know, or a rain day. Yeah. yeah. You know, many of the people that you mentioned in your book are all 
friends of ours or people yeah. that we've interviewed here on the show. Really? Like you mentioned, Charles Rosenay, who I've known since the late 80s. Yeah. You know? And um, it, Peter it, Asher, it, we've interviewed. Um, the Vec, have, the Vec yeah. was on late last late last year. Right. Right. And um, I wanted to thank you for the authors that you brought into the book because I work with Kid O'Toole. Okay. On the podcast show of Talk More Talk. And uh, it's kind of interesting what's said in those those few pages on Kit because she, she likes to bring up the fact that because she's a big Michael Jackson fan, mm -hmm. even though she heard Beatles music growing up as a kid, she didn't really latch on to that music. But because Paul worked with Michael Jackson, oh, wow. she wanted to listen to more of Paul's music because of Michael Jackson, you know, but that's not even mentioned there. But uh, it's it's kind of interesting. She didn't tell me that. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's interesting to me, you know, I have some what I call kids in the book, you know, my son's best friend. Yeah, you know, my son is now 28. But um, when I interviewed Nick, I don't know what they were in their early 20s. And Nick was the biggest fan. He knew more than me. And mm. it's amazing how these kids are coming up, you know, and it's not necessarily coming from their parents. You know, they're yeah. finding the music on their own and, and they're relating to it on their own. He went to a, a three day festival. He brought my son. Um and that's where I found out about the tattoos. So they went to this festival called Firefly Festival in mm -hmm. Delaware, maybe. You're and right. uh, it was a three-day festival with like electric punk bands and like whatever. I don't even know what they listened to. But Paul was the headliner. And that's what drew Nick. You know, and he was 19 years old. And, uh, and they didn't bring me. But um, he said <laughs> the tickets were $200 for the whole weekend. And he said, you know, everybody stayed for Paul. And Nick and my son and, and Nick's girlfriend... They waited four hours right up next to the stage. And then like it just filled two football fields full of kids to watch Paul. That happened at Bonnaroo, to Bonnaroo Festival. Paul had headlined, I think, one day. And I heard uh, from someone who was there the unbelievable lines all day just to have a chance to be near the stage mm -hmm. where Paul was amongst all of these younger bands and younger artists uh there may have been one other like quote-unquote heritage artist on the bill or uh, maybe headlining another night at bonnaroo but mccartney almost positive was bonnaroo and it was like everyone got it and wanted to experience it yeah. and uh it pretty pretty unique and it's just again another generation yeah, it'll never end. It'll never end. And, uh, you know, Nick, you know, he's followed him around a little bit. And there's another girl that actually, we lived in Maryland for a little while before we moved back to New York. And she used to live next door to me. She was three years old when I lived next door to her. Now she's in her 20s. And she's the biggest fan. And her first job, she's a journalist now. And her first freelance story was the local nonprofit station in Baltimore held a rooftop a rooftop light concert during COVID. Uh, they ended up putting it on a boat because they couldn't do the logistics. But she wrote the story of that when she was in her early 20s, quoting the rooftop concert as if she was there for watching YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention Jude Kessler, mm -hmm. who I've interviewed several times. And you He's talked about dedication. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't know the full story of it took her 18 years to finish her first book. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's dedication. Uh, it sure is. And, and now she has like 50 about every little detail in her book. Yeah. yeah, you know, she puts she puts uh, all the factual information into novel form. So she writes them like stories, but everything's a true fact. And then she footnotes it all. Mm hmm you know, painstaking work, but they're beautiful. I just right. joked that she has 50 books, but actually how many are, what is she up to in her John Lennon series? I'm not is sure, maybe nine? Nine? No, no, no. No, I think she wanted it to be nine books. The most recent one, which I've been giving away on my website, is the fifth volume, Shades oh. of Life, part one. And I think her next book is is either done or it's almost done. Right, and, and she just made an audio book. Right. That was for the third volume called She Loves You. Mm -hmm. 
And these, if you're not familiar with Jude's books, I mean, they're yeah. substantial. Yeah. <laughs> they're rem remarkable. And she yeah. is a sweetheart. She's such a sweetheart. I wanted to say, this, someone who deserves a ton of credit is John Bazzini, who you mm. include in the book, because I mentioned his name in almost every one of our shows in the news, because when it comes to finding out anything about Beatle books, what new ones are coming out, he has, I wish I could see his whole collection. He lives in Connecticut. He doesn't live too far from me. I'm hoping to you know, get together with him and see his collection. But he collects anything that's printed on the Beatles, any magazines, any articles about them. Um, he's probably got most of the Beatle books that have been written mm -hmm. at this point. So he's very familiar with them. So anytime I need new information about what books are coming out, it's a very good chance it comes from him. Yeah, he has mine. I sent. I believe I sent him an autograph book. If I didn't, I will. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for including him in the book. Oh, yeah, of course. I think Charles introduced me to him. Hmm. Yeah. Dana, I wanted oh. to ask you, uh, if, if to put you on the spot, could you pick out one, maybe two, stories that you cover in your book that are were the ones that may be uh, surprising, uh, a, a big surprise isn't a good description, but uh, really maybe took your breath away or made you laugh the hardest? Or um, can you narrow it down to one or two that you would say, these, these are my favorites? Let's put it like that. Okay, well, one of my favorites is um, Walnut Ridge. You know, the story of how the festival there started. You know that story, right, Darren? Uh, yeah, but refresh. So the town uh, was going bankrupt. I don't remember what year it was. I think it was 2010. The town was going bankrupt. Um, they were having a city council meeting on, you know, how to, how to revitalize the town. And somebody there remembered that the Beatles did a secret landing there in 1964. They changed planes in the middle of the night because Brian Epstein wanted to take them to a uh, a resort or a spa somewhere in the middle of the country just for a breather during their first tour. So they changed planes in the middle of the night, thinking no one would see them. But three guys like came out of a college classroom or drove by. And one of the guys was best friends with the now mayor's sister. You know, the mayor at that time was 10 years old. And his sister was the president of the Walnut Ridge Beatles fan club. So the kid that drove by and saw the Beatles called her. And the word spread until there were reporters. So when the Beatles were coming back around, you know, Char uh, Charles Snap, you know, and he's this country man, you know, he just brings you into this story, you know. He says, you know, everybody, you know, you're supposed to go to church on Sunday, but it was the Beatles. So we knew we had a reprieve. And he says, you know, the crowd was bigger than a football stadium. It was 300 people. And then, uh, you know, he says, like, so the mayor got on the top of the car and says, everybody has to behave. So anyway, there's these amazing pictures that his sister took from that day that I don't know if they're published anywhere else. They're in the book. Anyway, so they parlayed that fact into is it called Beatles at the Ridge? What's it called? Abbey Road on the River? I'm not sure what that one's called. Oh, I should have looked it up. It's the Beatles on the River. Beatles at the Ridge? No. You're thinking of Abbey Road on the River. Yeah, Abbey yeah. Road on the River. It's the it's no, the one in Arkansas. It's the one in Arkansas. Yeah. It's Walnut Ridge, um, Arkansas. So uh, you know, they made like a Beatles statue, 20 foot four, 20 foot tall Beatles statue. They made the festival and now you know the town's in black and ten thousand people come every year and the Beatles save the town. That's my favorite story. My 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 the one that gives me chills is when I met Bill Heckle at uh Cavern City Tours. First of all, it was such a dream, you know. So I go to the Cavern Club, I'm at the wrong door. So he sends you know his assistant to come get me and bring me to I mean like this man could have been a Beatle. And I'm just dying you know i'm just a ball of nerves and i get up there and bill heckle the director of cavern city tours takes me into the boardroom which they spell b-o-r-e-d so right there you're comfortable and normally like i take capricious notes and i barely look up but he says he says 
The Beatles are more popular than Shakespeare. If I asked you to quote a Beatles lyric, or if I asked you to quote Shakespeare, you would know the Beatles lyric. You wouldn't know the Shakespeare lyric. And I, I looked up, I'm like, okay, I have to listen to this. And I turned on record, didn't take a note. And then his stories were amazing. When he was 16, he had, you know, he was, he was a child and he had two 16 year old aunts from two different families. And both of them, one of them hadn't been to school in four months. And her mother found out because the school called and said, oh, my God, we're so sorry. She's so sick. Is she in the hospital? You know, how is she? My mother said, there's nothing wrong. What are you talking about? She hasn't been to school in four months. And it turns out when the parents left for work, she would go to her friend's house, change out of her school uniform, put on mini skirt and boots and go see the Beatles play at the Cavern Club. <laughs> Cut school for four months. The other uh, auntie uh, did the same thing with work. She would go uh, see the see the Beatles during lunch and come back late from work and lost her job. And the grandma was furious because you know her job was important to the family. But those stories, yeah, those stories just give you chills. You know, you're you're just there in the moment. And then he was just so kind. He gave me, you know, tickets to the Cavern Club and tickets to the Magical Mystery Tour bus, and it was a dream. Mm. <laughs> I'm just the biggest, like, silliest fan, so. I kind of envy all the Beatles fans that got to see the Beatles at the Cavern many times. Yeah. There's a couple of stories of um, fans that got to see the Beatles live at Shea and in Philadelphia. Yeah, those stories give you chills. Did you find when you were interviewing people in Liverpool that um, a, a lot of people who were fans of them in their very earliest days kind of maintained that? Uh, passion for them or did, did they just sort of did, did a lot well, of what Bill, what Bill Hackle told me is you know there was a, a turn because you know John moved to London and then the people in Liverpool felt slighted hmm. so um, you know they kind of turned against the Beatles and that's when his aunties gave him all their Beatles records and he became a fan and then sadly you know everybody turned back after John's murder mm-hmm Okay. Kenya, think... I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I was throwing it to you. Do you think that the Beatles, in a way, are kind of bigger now than they've ever been? I mean, nothing can compare to how it was in the '60s as it was happening, and you got to witness every song and every album, and it was an event. Not to mention the tours and the movies and all that. But when you consider the fact that there's hardly ever a week that goes by when I'm not on the internet and I'm looking at Yahoo's main page and there's a story about the Beatles or there's a story about one of them and there's still a lot of radio programs on the Beatles. There's more and more podcasts than ever before on the Beatles. The Beatle books never stop coming out. <laughs> I think there's more coming out now than there ever has been before. And with people finding new angles to write about them. So, and then you hear about how well they're doing on Spotify and people streaming their songs, young people streaming their songs. There's a lot of Beatles tribute bands out there. So your book touches on all of that. In yeah. a way, do you think that the Beatles are even bigger now than they were? Well, I think it's twofold. I think, you know, the music itself draws people in, but then I think their message is just so powerful you know, with the with the country so divided, with everything going on in the world, I think their message is more powerful now, perhaps than it was then. Um, and part of it is just the arc of their story. You know, they came up in a way that bands don't come up anymore. You know, like I have a musician friend that tells me it's it's more like selling your business to a label than somebody goes to a club and says, oh, my God, this band is amazing. You know, they just don't come up the way they did. And I think the story of how they came up, the brotherhood between them, you know, is amazing. Everybody would love to have a friend group like that. There's just so much to it. And I think just about every single Beatle fan, while the, I'm sure they love all four Beatles, can identify with one of them more than the other. Yeah. The others. Yeah. So I think that also helps in their appeal, their wide appeal. And I, I think they're a connector. I think somebody had told me, and I really, I really feel this, that... Um, you know, it makes outsiders feel included. And, you know, they were such a connector 
back in the 60s, you know, they they wouldn't play at the Gator Bowl because it was segregated and they wouldn't play until until they um what do you call it? Until they let everybody in together. I don't I can't think of the word. But you know, way back then they were inclusive of everybody. So I think it still speaks to people today. Hmm. Integrated, that's the word. <laughs> All right, Alan, uh, anything else? Um, don't think so. Um, should, we've done like an hour. Should we wrap it up? Yes, I was going to I was going to I was going to actually repeat a question that was asked already, the closing question. Like I know, Dana, you alluded to this already. Um, what's next? Where do you go from here? Uh, would you consider a volume two of this or is this done? And if you did write another book on the Beatles, do you feel you want to go into, you were talking about the collecting possibility? Well, the uh, collecting possibility, I think, would be more along the same lines of, you know, how 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 the Beatles shaped their lives and why why they wanted to become a collector. And then the great stories of how they found these things. But it would be the same kind of line. And then, uh, you know, it's been suggested to me that I should start a podcast and have people tell their stories. Um yeah, I love hearing people's stories. And, you know, for me, the goal is to have my own story. I'm actually going to see the concert um, in, L in the Hollywood Bowl on Thursday, and I'm going to bring a book with me and try to pass it along. Um, so, yeah, hopefully I'll have my own story to tell one day. Okay. That's the tribute to Jimmy Buffett. Right. Right. Oh, Just, nice. Very nice. As in, didn't um, know. Very to. Uh, kind of like um, a behind the scenes question. What was the experience like for you writing your fir first book? Easier, harder? Uh, did you meet challenges you didn't expect? Um, um, what What was that like after doing lots of like articles, right? Freelance mm -hmm. work. Now your first book, you came away with that, with uh, with what? Like for example, I'm asking you this because I've been I've said this before. I've been toying with writing a book. Okay, I just learned how to spell. And I want to use my skills and it's like, but what am I getting into? Um, right. So from well, your perspective, what was the experience like writing this first book? Well, for me, you know, I did it in a way that I knew how to do it. You know, I, I interviewed people and then wrote essays regarding their interviews. So it's, it's more like a lot of long form articles put together into an anthology because that's the way I know how to do it. I took it in short pieces. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to do, you know, a long form novel kind of thing. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I never, I never looked at it as, oh, I have to write 200 pages because that's way too overwhelming, you know? So I would look at it as each interview, you know, were about 3000 words. <laughs> I mean, Al someone like Alan, like, and I'm serious about, there's a sort of, there's an intimidation factor there. Mm -hmm. You know, Alan writes, the McCartney legacy is going to be five volumes mm. when all is said and done. Okay. It, it have the second coming of Harry Potter here, folks. Uh, and these aren't, these, you know, and the amount of, how do you, how do you just keep that energy, the focus? Jeez, I'm just interested. How do you stay awake? I mean, when you, you know, when you, when I know there had to be a time for you, Dana, when you're coming down to the end, when you do have a deadline now on you and there are things you want to change and you don't know if you're going to have enough time to make those changes. And there were changes that were made, I'm sure, that you don't like and you wish you could slip them back in there when no one's looking. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just... actually, to be honest, they really they really didn't change anything. They kept my words, which is amazing to me. Um, they... Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was daunting, you know, when they said, write 25,000 words in three months, I had no idea how I was going to do that, you know, but um, I just kept it churning. And yeah, you know, it was scary. You know, sometimes I'd be up till six in the morning biting my nails. But when it, when it's over, it's good. You know, writer always says, you know, the worst part about writing is writing. And when it's over, that's the good part. <laughs> like banging your head against the wall. Yeah, yeah. Stop, it feels so good. Right. But also, when you're a writer, and especially if you're writing about the Beatles or something you really love doing, everything you do 
is tax deductible. <laughs> I'm just learning that now, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dana, thank you so much. Uh, apologize. We apologize for this t t having taken so long to schedule, but uh, it's been it's been a joy. And thank you so much for being our guest. And for being you know, such I a really appreciate you having me on. I love your show. And this is just a thrill. This is another, there's been so many pinch me moments since the book's been published. And this is another one. Oh, oh we have to say where to. <laughs> if you do a volume two, we've got plenty of people we could lead you to. Yeah. Oh, I would love that. I really would. Um, and, and so let's say where the book, where they can buy the book. So I have a website where they can buy personalized autographed copies which is Beatlemania lives on 21.com. 21 is for 21st century. Um, and then if they don't want a personalized copy, they can go to Amazon or all the, all the uh, book sites, Barnes and Noble, um, my publisher, McFarland, Thrift Books. But you should buy from me because then you're supporting me and you get my autograph and it could be worth something. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You, you should consider signing the book and have Darren sign it with you. Can you imagine what that will go for on eBay? That would be pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, well, no, you may have to end up paying your own shipping. Then. <laughs> and there's Emily. I think I told you, and it might be then in the credits, uh, her age or the year. I think she was around 11 or 12. I think you told this me was, she was 11. Yeah. This was at Westbury Music. Well, whatever it's called now. Yeah, they NYCB. Their name theater. every week. Uh, but what was Westbury Music Fair uh, on Long Island? Uh, by complete chance, I think I asked uh, Ringo's uh, publicist, you know, my daughter's a fan, she's going to come. Uh, and it was it was like, oh, okay, fine, no problem. Wait a minute, don't you want to hear the whole, I prepared this whole thing to get you to let me backstate? Um, well, you know the story of where um, Emily, when she was younger, drew a picture for Ringo. Yeah. Right? I think that I may have probably used that to kind of, here's part two of this. Mm -hmm. uh, 23rd, in, in 2003, when Ringo Rama came out, Ringo was doing publicity. That's when I got to interview him at the Carlisle Hotel. Uh, and I think I got 20 minutes with him. And he had like an internal clock. Mm. Like when that 20 minutes was up, Ringo sprung, like he was spring loaded mm -hmm. off the chair, <laughs> said goodbye, and went out the door. Um, for that interview, at that time, my daughter, who was four, four years old, maybe five. I don't remember how old she is now, let alone back then. She had this uh, really wicked hip um, infection that warranted them going in and cleaning out the infection out of them. She was in a body cast for two months. Um, and around that time, the interview happened. She loved Ringo and she drew him a picture. And I brought it and uh, to the interview and he signed, he signed a good a copy of Goodnight Vienna to Emily. And he signed my copy of the Ringo Rama to Darren. And I felt bad for my engineer because he already, Ringo kind of had even then the strict rules with these, his signatures. He wouldn't personalize anything. And, and my engineer, Chris broke out a copy of his dad's white album. And Ringo said, Nope, not going to personalize it. And he just scribbled his name on it. So I said to Chris afterwards, I said, see, you should have had your father draw a picture for Ringo. Maybe <laughs> then he would have personalized the White Album. Um, and that's then several years later, we're backstage at Nassau College, um, um, Westbury Music Fair, where this picture was taken. We had front row seats, Emily and I. Oh. And, it, you know, Westbury Music Fair in the round. Uh, and at one point, the stage would come very close to where we were sitting. Ringo reached in and grabbed a handful of Emily's popcorn out of her bucket, was eating the popcorn. You know, somebody was playing the guitar solo, I guess. Um, That's in the book. Yeah. yeah. Did, she, did she save the bucket? Mm -hmm. she did. I probably did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. But <laughs> that was that was that. But that was also unexpected. That was like, did he just do what I think he did? <laughs> So, yeah. anyway, it's stories like that, uh, fun, uh, lighthearted in, in, this, in the stressful times we live in today. Uh, pick up a copy of 
Beatlemania lives on, super fans in the 21st century. Dana Klausner wrote it. Dana, thank you so much for coming on Things We Said Today and spending a little time with us. And thank you. Uh, we want to have you back, so get working. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what a pleasure having Dana Klausner on as a guest on today's Things We Said Today. As I mentioned during the show, we tried, uh, we were trying, we've been trying to get her on since the fall. I'm glad we were finally able to make it happen. One more time, the book is uh, Beatlemania Lives On, Super Fans in the 21st Century. Uh, so pick that up, published by McFarlane Books. So let's go around the horn and uh, tell the good folks things they know need to know about us individually. Ken? Uh, first of all, my other podcast, Beatles Podcast, which is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Our next show, which will be on April the 15th, tax time, um, will be part two of uh, a series here. Rolling Stone just uh, published. Uh, Rob Sheffield uh, compiled his list of the top 100 solo Beatles songs. So last week, we discussed songs 100 through 51. Next Monday, April 15th, will go from 50 to number one. Find out what song was rated the number one best solo Beatles song of all time. And it's not the Utopia National Anthem. I no, get... no. Because okay. then they take the Rolling Stone article off Facebook then. Okay. <laughs> or you could just cheat. Just go online and look. But if you want something more suspenseful, it was a cool list. Hmm? It was a cool list, even though it really didn't make. It didn't seem. It seemed rather random, but it was a. It was a fun list. There's a, a, you know, a great mixture of hits and a lot of deep cuts, and some songs you're you'd be surprised were even in. Yeah, true. The one hundred, the top one hundred. So uh, if you can, please subscribe to our channel. We're on YouTube. Every Monday night at 9 p.m. live, 9 p.m. Eastern. Talk more talk, the solo Beatles video cast. Ken Michaels Radio, my YouTube channel, which is loaded with all kinds of interviews and conversations on the Beatles. My most recent show was with Luca Parasi, who uh, put out the book, Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. The stories behind the songs from 1970 to 1989, and we discussed the Press to Play album. There'll be new shows coming very soon, I promise you. Um, also, Every Little Thing, my radio show, which is on some 50 radio stations right now. Um, you can listen to the last two shows that aired on radio station WFDU. They're in their archives, so you don't have to listen at a specific time. You have two weeks to listen to each show once it's on their website. Go to WFDU.FM on their ar archival page and type in Every Little Thing. And then there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, with lots of interviews on there as well. Those are strictly audio interviews. And then there's my Beatles trivia page, where you can win great prizes, like the McCartney Legacy. You notice, by the way, on our show, Alan always has the sure. McCartney Legacy behind him right there. And I got mine right over there. We kind of bookend the top part of the screen this way. Nice. You know, so <laughs> Make me look bad. Yes. <laughs> you've got to put your copy above the uh the furniture behind you when you just completely just sidetracked very quickly when the first book came out and the cover was red i'm assuming a plan had been in, put in place where the books were going to each have a different unique color basically but we hadn't decided what the other colors would be we have now for right. the next one which is you know blue plaid oh right blue Red and the blue. All right. That's it, Ken? And, uh, that's it. You that's sure? all I got for you. Yeah. Got something for us, Alan? Yeah, you know, if you want to get in touch with me, I got two Facebook pages. Um, just Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can get in touch with us by email, all of us, at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have 
from our many Facebook pages. We're now focusing on one, which is Things We Said Today video podcast, right? Yes, Things We Said Today video podcast. The um, Right now, the cover photo on the Facebook page is the cover of the McCartney Legacy Volume 2. Yeah. Uh, and it's blue. That's maybe right now. Uh, I'll leave it alone there. That's the page you're looking for. Please like us or follow us there. And um, the other, well, at least one of the pages, older pages, will eventually be shut down uh, just so that we could consolidate everything into one place. And I want to apologize in advance. I realized a little while ago I was making all kinds of eclipse posts and I actually shared everything on the things we said today page as well. So um that stuff's there now, but please join us at the new page. Um, things we said today, video podcast. And the new right. show will be there. Well, by the time you hear this, you'll have probably gotten it from the page. Um, right. We're on YouTube. Please like our pa- or follow our page if you haven't already or subscribe to it, whatever it is that they call it there. Um, we're on Podbeam. Um, subscribe to us there too. Podbean distributes to everyone else, including Apple. Um, so we're all over the place and not hard to find. And once again, that email address, if you want to write to us, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Right. And as for me, you could catch me on WFUV Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. Um, this coming Saturday, uh, the radio station spring membership drive is going to uh, begin. Our on-air fundraiser will last through next week. Uh, Friday, I don't know what the date is, but from, from this coming Saturday to the Friday after, uh, we'll be uh, fundraising. And you can go to WFUV.org, our website, where you can also listen to us. And you can make a contribution. And my on-air schedule is going to be completely different during that week. Um, so I'll put that stuff on my Facebook page, if you care. Actually, I put it on my Facebook page as a way to remind me what I need, where I need to be and when. Um, so uh, those are my on-air hours, FUVs at 90.7 FM in New York City. Uh, or you can stream us at WFUV.org um, or get our app, another way, cool way to listen to us. And uh, also two Facebook pages. I notice I've been doing this the whole show. The camera is right here. Uh, the two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo and Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatle Podcaster. Uh, get in touch and we'll stay in touch then. And um, that's about it uh, for this week's edition of Things We Said Today. We'll see you in all likelihood in two weeks. For Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeVivo. And again, thank you so much for spending time with us on things we said today. Later.